am intrigued by stories and there's lots of different elements in stories that can draw us in and some stories are inspiring and some stories are just really interesting and some stories are tragic and this story that I'm gonna share a little bit with you about today has a couple elements of each one and it's about this guy um, named Steve Prefontaine. Have you guys ever heard of him? Anybody? He had a really awesome mustache and he was a distance runner in the 1970s and he was really famous and in 1972 he was going in to run in the Summer Olympics and he competed in, in distance running the 5,000 meters was the distance he was going to be running in this particular Olympics uh, which is a pretty long run and he was one of the favorites in the whole world uh, in this race. He, he didn't lose very much. He was really, really fast. Um, he was one of the key elements to getting Nike popularized. If you guys have ever owned a Nike thing, um, shoes, shirt, hat, helmet, bat, socks. Um, he was part of making that famous because he wore those kind of things. And when he went to the Olympics, uh, he knew that he was going to be up, up, up against some really stiff competition, that the people he was going to be running against were also world class. And there was a few particular runners that he just knew that if he ran in a particular way, he wouldn't be able to win the race. And so he didn't want to just cruise along for a few thousand meters and then wait to the end and then sprint it out and see who could win in a sprint. His strategy was, I'm going to try and sprint basically the whole race. I'm just going to go crazy and get way out in the front and if somebody wants to beat me, they're just going to have to have more heart and more guts than me to get to the end because I'm just going to run fast as I can basically the whole time. And so. That's basically how it went. Everyone started and everyone was in a big clump and they got to a point way before normally the runners would kick it into high gear where he just took off and went way ahead of everybody else. And that was kind of shocking to the people who were announcing the race, who were calling it for radio and things like that. They didn't really know what he was doing, but with only about a mile left, he was way ahead. He had the lead and he was just going to try and hold on to the lead until the end. And so he kept, kept going, kept going, kept going. And it turns out that as the race kind of came to a close, it got really close. And right in the last couple seconds, he ended up being passed by a couple of guys, three guys, and he ended up getting fourth and missing out on the gold medal by two seconds. He missed out by two seconds and he, he had run and he had his strategy but he just ran out of gas and even though he had one of the fastest starts that anyone had ever seen, he just couldn't finish. And in the closing seconds he ended up, you know, just not being able to keep up with the pace of these other world class r runners that were just going straight by him and he ended up not being able to get an Olympic medal that year. So not only did he not win which was his ultimate goal, but he didn't get second or third either. He ended up getting in fourth and, and that was really disappointing for him. Really disappointing because uh, he had started really well and, and he was well known and his whole life up to that point had been really phenomenal. Everything had been going his way. At 19 years old, he was on the cover of Sports Illustrated magazine, which for somebody in sports is a pretty big deal. He was a celebrity. People, when he would run these long races, people sometimes would just chant his name the whole time. And if you're running a long distance race and someone is willing to chant your name for however long it takes you to run 5,000 meters, those people are going to lose their voice and it's just crazy. But people were just really into him. In college, he never lost a 5,000 meter or a 10,000 meter race, ever. He just won and won and won nonstop. He was basically the ultimate cross country and track star at the University of Oregon. He, he even held the American record for seven different events at the same time, which is pretty incredible that someone could, could do all of that. But sadly, just like his run in the Olympics, his life ended up, even though it started off so well, not ending in the best possible way. And after he graduated from college and he had this awesome record of victory and um, just dominating, he continued to train and he was getting ready for the 1976 Olympics. Four years, um, three years had gone by. He was really wanting to 
you know, make up for his fourth place finish and get the gold. And so he had been training hard. He had been working all the time. And uh, in May 1975, so a year before when the 1976 Olympics came around, he ran a race and he won. And after the race, he went with some of the people from the race to a party. And he ended up um, leaving the party in the middle of the night and driving home. And on the way home, he ended up crashing his car and dying. And when the, the police found him, he had uh, elevated blood alcohol level. And people, you know, the evidence shows that he likely died because of his own drunk driving, that he took his own life away by accident, which is way more tragic than not winning a race in the Olympics. And even though he had everything going for him, and even though his life started off so well, it ended in complete tragedy. And people were just taken aback. People were just just so heartbroken. In fact, if you go to where his, where he crashed his car today, um, there's still a, like a big monument to him there. And all around that entire area, wherever you go, people kind of just almost, um, are almost still sad because of, of what happened in his life. That this, this life that started off so well and this person who had so much promise that it all ended just like that because of one fast, big mistake. And in the Bible, there's uh, plenty of characters whose story kind of mirrors um, that of Steve Prefontaine, where things seem to be going well, and then at a certain point, because of a decision that was made, everything just fell apart. And one of the ones that comes to my mind is the story of Samson. And this this is a really famous story, and he is one of the more famous Old Testament characters in the Bible. And he had a great start to his life, but like Steve Prefontaine, he fell short. And he ended up uh, making some big mistakes that, that cost him dearly. And before Samson was even born, an angel came to his parents, to his mom and his dad, and told them that he was going to have special gifts. That's a pretty good sign, right? If an angel of God comes and says, your child is going to be not just special in the way that all people are, but I'm going to give him special gifts. And he would accomplish great things because the Lord God would be with him. And as Samson grew up, the Lord blessed him and he directed Samson's path. And the Bible says that the Spirit of the Lord gave him great strength so that he was stronger than anyone else. In fact, one story is uh, that the Bible records talks about how when an army of a thousand Philistines, so the Philistines were a people who had, during Samson's time uh, were enslaving the Israelite people, they were oppressing them. And so an army of a thousand Philistine soldiers uh, tied Samson up because he was causing them all kinds of trouble. And he broke the ropes that they tied him up with like they were nothing. And then he killed all of the people who tried to imprison him. One guy against a thousand. He had a very special life. He had very special gifts. He was set apart in an awesome way. And of course, when he did this to the Philistines, they got a little bit more upset. And so they started scheming because they, they knew that they needed to find a way to stop Samson from doing what he was doing. They wanted to take him out. They wanted to bring him down. And so they started putting together a plan for his downfall. They wanted to understand and put together a design to remove him from the equation. So they discovered that Samson had fallen in love with this Philistine woman named Delilah. They came to her and told her that if she discovered the secret of Samson's strength, if they found out why he was so strong, that they would pay her a fortune. And she decided to go with that. She decided that she was willing to be a part of this plot and try and bring Samson down, try and ruin his life, try and take him out. Um, so she asks him this question. She said, Please tell me, where does your great strength come from? How could someone tie you up and make you helpless? Now, you would think if somebody asked you this question, you would get suspicious that some alarm bells might be going off in your mind and you might be wondering, why would this woman that I'm in love with be asking me, so, Samson, what would someone need to do in order to make you helpless 
so that when they tied you up, you couldn't do anything about it. You'd be like, oh, uh, maybe I shouldn't tell this person what's going on. He should have been wondering if, if the woman that he loved had some ulterior motives, and maybe he did, because at first, he told her a lie. He said that if he was tied up with, with new bowstrings, that he would become weak. So she was like, oh, okay new bowstrings. And the next day he woke up and found that she had tied him up with bowstrings. And even worse, there were a bunch of Philistines in the room ready to kill him while he was weak. But he snapped off the strings like they were nothing and killed the Philistines and, you know, just took care of the whole situation. And you would think at that point he would be like, Delilah, I, I just told you that if you tied me up, or if anyone tied me up with bowstrings, and I would lose my strength, I would be helpless, and I would be able to be killed, and here I am the very next day, and it seems that that thing that we just talked about somehow happened to me. What's, what's going on here? He, he probably should have been asking those kind of questions, but what's amazing is she turned the whole thing around on him. She basically flipped the whole scenario. You would think that he would be upset with her for trying to betray him, and, and she had been totally caught in the act. But what she did was she started crying and saying that she couldn't believe that he would lie to her. So she's like, how could you do this? You told me that if I tied you up like this, that you'd be helpless. And look at you, you're not helpless. You're a liar. I'm upset. <laughs> and so she basically just flipped the whole thing. So instead of him being upset with her because she was trying to kill him, she was upset with him because of he told her this didn't just happen one time. It kept going on time after time after time. And she would say, oh, tell me the secret of how we, I can tie you up and make you helpless. And he'd say, oh, well, you do this. And then she would go and do this, and there would be a bunch of Philistines. And then um, he would kill them. And then, you know, a little while later, she'd be like, okay, well, what, what is it really? You know, that's in the past. Remember how I tried to have you killed before? Don't worry about that. But this time, tell me, um, and we'll work it out. And eventually, amazingly, he actually told her the truth. After seeing this happen time after time after time, and her trying to harm him, her trying to take his life away, he told her the reality that if his hair was cut, he would lose his great strength. And this was because he was a Nazarite, and this was a special kind of person who dedicated their life to following the Lord. And one of the things that they did, among many things that represented their commitment to God, was that they wouldn't cut their hair. And so one night, the Bible says while he was asleep, Delilah came in and cut off his hair. And then the Philistines were able to come in and capture him. And this is absolutely tragic. And the consequences of this were that they took him to the temple of the God that they worshipped, and they made him work there. But worse than that, they, they gouged out his eyes and they made him into a joke. People would see him there and they would say, look at Samson, he used to be awesome for that, that God that the Israelites used to follow, but <laughs> look at him now, he's, he's nothing. And they would mock him and make fun of him, and by doing that they, would, they made fun of the God who had made Samson strong in the first place. But eventually that story ends that, that Samson ended up growing his hair back over time, and he prayed that God would give him strength. And the story ends with him being placed in a position of the temple where he was against some pillars that, that held everything up, and he, he knocked them over, and everyone in the temple uh, died, and, including him. And his life ended in that kind of way where he was able to uh, destroy some of God's enemies, but it cost him dearly in the end, and it certainly wasn't the plan that he would have drawn up in the beginning. So we want to just take a little while to look at what actually happened here. The crazy thing is that he didn't realize that Delilah was his enemy. He didn't realize that the person that he loved, the person that he cared about, was actually trying to undermine his life, was actually trying to, to kill him, was trying to take him completely apart. He loved her, he opened up his life to her, he wanted to be cared about, and she actually wanted him dead. 
That's a big inconsistency going on, and it's something that, um, that we can learn from in our own personal lives, because that same kind of thing can happen to us. And let me ask, it, ask you this in this way, because I don't think there's probably uh, any Philistine women who are particularly trying to kill you, but, but what the Bible teaches is that there is somebody who's trying to kill you, and there are things that are trying to destroy your life. And the question is, do you recognize that the aim of sin in your life is to destroy you? And a lot of times when we think about sin, we think about it as, you know, well, I just shouldn't do that, or God doesn't like that. But the consequences of sin, the Bible teaches, isn't just that God doesn't like it. It says the results of sin, the wages of sin, the end result of sin is death. Now that death is a bad consequence for us. And so when, when we choose to engage in sin, when we live a, a sinful life, the consequence for sin is going to be a big problem for us. And there's several times in the Bible when it talks about sin's aim for our lives. If you uh, read about God's conversation early on in the Bible with Cain, and he's, Cain is struggling with his brother Abel, and God says to him, Don't you know that sin is crouching at your door and it's waiting to pounce on you? That it's, it's just waiting for you to come out unawares and it will, it will destroy you? And we see other things in the Bible where it talks about the nature of, of what Satan wants to accomplish for us, that, that the enemy comes to steal and to kill and destroy, or, or that, that the enemy goes about like a roaring lion looking for you so that he can devour you, looking for you so that he can rip you apart. And that's what the Bible teaches us about the consequences of sin. And, and amazingly, sometimes we live a life like Samson where we don't realize that sin actually destroys our lives. And he was able to somehow go for a significant amount of time loving Delilah even though she wanted him dead. And in our lives, it's possible that we can live our life loving certain sins certain things that don't please God and making them a part of our regular life without realizing or without being willing to recognize that those sins will destroy our lives, that the enemy wants to use those things to ruin you. You are not some kind of neutral party here on earth. You know, the reality is if you're following God, if you're a Christian, if you're a part of Jesus' family, there is an enemy who wants to ruin you. And it's not, not somebody who's silly. It's not somebody who's stupid. It's somebody who's systematically trying to determine how to take you out of the equation. Because just like uh, the Philistines recognized that Samson could turn the tides and, and free Israel from the Philistines, make a big difference for the cause of God, Satan realizes that you... Because if you're a believer, you have the Holy Spirit in you. You are a powerful agent of God in this world if you will be used by Him. And, and He wants to take you out of the equation. He does not want to see you make a difference for the cause and for the kingdom of God. And sin, when we look at it, we engage in it because it promises us, us things like satisfaction and pleasure and happiness, but in the end, it leads to none of those things. And like Steve Prefontaine or like Samson, a lot of you guys have a lot going for you in your life. You are talented people. You are smart people. You're friendly. You're good with people. You guys all have different kinds of gifts. God has equipped you and designed you perfectly. He did not make a mistake when he put you here. You are, are, are loved by God and you have been designed with a mighty purpose. You have awesome potential for your life and, and much of it is ahead of you. But Satan wants to do what he did to Samson in your life. He, he, he is fine with it if he can see you start well and then he can derail you and, and take you apart. And we don't want to be like that. We don't want to live that life. And there is good news for us, for people um, who have failed, because if you think about your own life, 
the decisions you make, the choices you, you've made, the attitudes that you've had, the life that you've chosen to live, all of us have chosen willingly to engage in things that we know don't please God. But amazingly, God isn't up there saying, well, Satan's your enemy on this side, and now I'm your enemy on this side. He's saying, I want to redeem you. I want to make you new. I want to save you from this sin. And the Bible says that while we were enemies of God, that he chose to love us. That while we were sinners, Christ died for us. That he chose to love us in spite of everything that we do and everything that we are. That God doesn't want to be your enemy and the mistakes that you've made, the, fail, the failures in your life, God doesn't want to hold those against you because Jesus paid the price for your sins on the cross. So as we move forward, this is what we need to think about. Am I a person who loves God more than I love sin? Am I a person who's willing to turn away from my sins and follow God? Am I a person who's willing to see my sin for what it is, destructive plan of our enemy to destroy us? Or am I going to continue playing games with it? Or am I going to continue just trying to manage it? Or am I going to continue to, you know, just not think about it? The good news says that we need to see sin for what it is and understand that God forgives us for the depths and the gravity of all of the evil in our lives and he wants to turn us around and allow us to be made new. And, and God's plans are perfect and they're for our good. And Jesus came, the Bible says, to offer us life to the fullest, the best, and he does love us. We have evidence of that in the gospel. He left heaven and he came and he died for you because he loves you. That's incredible that God would do that. That's, that's proof. And he does have the power to give us joy and happiness and pleasure. And he's proven that because he rose from the dead. And our ultimate fear in life, something that every person is afraid of, is death. It's given us proof Whereas sin promises to give us satisfaction and happiness and every time, every time, it comes up empty. So the challenge is for us to spend our life on Christ. Because if we spend our lives on sin and we spend our lives on just making a big deal out of ourselves, we end up being empty and broken. That's the end result. But Christ, because of how amazing he is. Chose to become empty. The Bible says to, to empty himself, come down here. He chose to be broken on the cross so that we wouldn't have to be. So that we could be made new. So that the sin that once held us down, so that the plan of our enemy to destroy our lives could be taken out of the picture because we have a mighty God who redeems us. The idea that you can be satisfied through sin in your life is a lie. Okay, so for, for those of you who think that by building yourself up, you'll be satisfied, that is a lie. If you think that just by getting more stuff, the newest, the coolest, that's a lie. If you think just by being more popular, more liked, more loved by the people around you is going to make you happy or give you satisfaction, that is a lie. If you think that a relationship with another person is going to give you what you need, you're going to get that relationship and realize that you're still missing out on what you need. Putting anything before God, choosing to do things that don't please God, living your life in any kind of fashion that doesn't make Him central in your life will not satisfy you. And I'm praying that all of you guys would choose to take a hard look at your life Consider your habits. Consider your choices. Consider who you want to be. And then determine how you're going to respond to the gospel of God who loves you, who guarantees you a new life, hope, satisfaction, pleasure, and ultimately all of that is wrapped up in a relationship with Him. Are you going to take that? Or are you going to take chasing after sin, chasing after other things because you think that those things are going to somehow uh, make you whole? It's just, that's something for us all to consider 
and to respond to. Because there, we, I shared two stories today about Steve Prefontaine and about Samson, about guys who had a lot going for them and things just fell apart because of their decisions. Are you going to be a person who chooses to run away from God's plan for your life and choose to live in a way that doesn't please Him and, and see your life crash and burn because you're embracing a plan of somebody who designed that plan, Satan, for you to crash and burn? Or are you going to choose to embrace the plan of God for your life, which might cost you something, which might be difficult, but will ultimately end up in your satisfaction? Don't be like these men that we talked about today. Don't be somebody who, who thinks that playing games with sin or choosing to think about following God later is going to satisfy you or, or be what you need to do in your life. Recognize the truth. Sin leads to death. And following Christ leads to life. It is simple, but it, it, and I understand that it is difficult. But if you do what you need to do in your life to orient yourself towards following Christ and turning away from sin, you will be satisfied. And you will find joy. You will have hope. And your life will have meaning. You know how I know? Because that's what Christ promises us. And He's God. And He doesn't fail. And He doesn't come up empty. So for all of you who have been looking for joy or happiness or satisfaction in other things, and have felt yourself coming up empty, don't do that anymore. Turn to something better. Turn to a relationship with Christ that is deep and rich and meaningful. Because when you do that, everything will change. And can you imagine these guys? Can you imagine a, a, a Samson who wasn't derailed? What could he have accomplished for God? What could, what could he have done? And how might the story have, have been? We want to write that story for our lives. Our relationship with God before us pursuing anything else. Let me pray for us. And, uh, and I would ask that you guys really consider the decisions that you personally make. God, I thank you so much for the students who are here today. And I pray that they would see the, the reality about who you are. And I pray that they would see the reality about the nature and destructive power of sin. God, I ask that you would help them uh, to make wise choices. Not just so that they could live a good life, but so that they could have life with you. God, use them for your glory. Use them for your kingdom. Give them the, the wisdom to see uh, the end result of anything that doesn't glorify you. And give them the strength to turn away from sin. And give them the understanding that following you is better and following you is worth it. Because you satisfy. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Thank you guys very much.